in the teaching of children's literature, what can we say about Peter's 40th anniversary? Robin, I think there's three things we can say. One is that Peter has always been able to pick what's next for teachers and teachers' needs in the classroom. Peter's also been able to set an agenda using research and putting that into practical resources for teachers. And thirdly, Peter has been able to think about real texts and how real texts are needed for real reading experiences. Now, if I think about that first one in terms of what's next, Peter published uh, at the end of last year a text on children's literature, and in doing that, it was able to see what was next in the curriculum, and it answered that need. Now, clearly, that was something that took some planning, and it didn't all happen in the last, you know, few months, but the ability to be able to look forward and see what teachers will need in their hands as a practical resource has been one of the reasons that they've been around for 40 years. And when Peter Freebody, in the previous video, congratulated Peter on the 40 years, uh, and he called it 200 dog years in his mischievous way. This is the kind of thing that he was referring to in the ability to set an agenda. They use research and they build from the research real practical texts for teachers to use, which are research-based. And so they've been able to kind of look at what the chalk face, or perhaps I should say the electronic whiteboard face these days, is needed, what's needed there, and how that can be disseminated to teachers in practical ways. And then thirdly, the notion of real text is important because literature has always been part of what Peter has been on about from its very beginning. And so the notion of putting literature into teachers' hands and the idea of real texts needed for real reading experiences has been a thread right through their publications. So what's the importance of children's literature in the primary English classroom since 1972? Could you track that for us? Peter actually started tracking it uh, in, the, in his video when he talked about the new English that emerged in 1972. And this new English really changed the way we worked with English in the primary classroom. James Britton's Language and Learning was a very important text at the time and it really focused on the importance of talk in children's learning. And so what happened there was a whole radical shift in the way that classrooms were organised. The uh, new thought, which has been called progressive thought, really pushed the way that talking happened, which meant that there was group work, that there was flexibility, that there was uh, lots of all kinds of talk and creativity. And that creativity was built into the new term, the new name for subject English, which was language arts. And that's very interesting because the notion of language arts picks up on the idea of language and art as a creative link between the two. And uh, it really changed the way that the classrooms were presented and how they were organised. Gordon Winch says this was a change from the serried rows of silent faces in his first publication for Peter. And when you think that it was only 40 years ago that this dominant model from the 1900s was dominant in our classrooms, and now we have an entirely different looking classroom with groups and flexibility and all the things that the New English brought in. Children's literature has always had an educational emphasis then, Narang. Yes, it has. And Plato was one of the first to talk about it in the Republic, or our first recording of thinking about children's literature as having an educational emphasis, when he wanted it, the stories that children read and hear to be ones that gave them direction for the utmost uh, excellence of character. And so we've got that sense of literature teaching children how to be in the world from that very early time. But of course, we didn't actually have a view of childhood or a view of child readers for a very long while. And it wasn't until really the 1700s that we began to think about children's literature as such, because the idea of childhood was then present in the way that the culture, in the way that we were thinking. Um, and there's a preface there from that uh, very first book, Sarah Fielding's first book, which says, the use of books is to make you, the reader, child reader, wiser and better. So from the very beginning, we've had this didactic approach. 
And that is still true in some social and cultural groups today. But as we know, modern Western children don't like to be lectured to, and so that tends to have disappeared in most of our Western contemporary uh, literature, whether they're picture books or novels. Though young children will still read them today as fables from the past. A stitch in time saves nine, or slow and steady wins the race, are morals that sit at the end of the fable. So we still have that present. So what occurs more frequently, though, is what Peter Hollandale, the UK children's literature academics, calls the second level of ideology, where the beliefs are are implicit and they're hidden and often unconsciously hidden by the author. And they are present, but they're not overt. And a well-known example is Enid Blyton. Now, Enid Blyton is much loved and I certainly read all her books, devoured them all when I was a child. But what has been seen that happens there is that her characters, who are upper-middle-class children, speak very disparagingly of other characters who are not of their class. And so the policemen or the local children or the shopkeepers are all seen as rather stupid or untrustworthy or even dishonest. Now, this is an implicit kind of uh, belief that is there. And Blyton, it seems, assumes that these beliefs about those who have not, are not of the children's class are shared by the community and shared by the readers. So it's not stated, it's implicit. So this unexamined view takes us directly into the classroom with a reader-oriented approach to reading, which was part of what happened in the New English. As the New English started to develop with group work, the idea of reader response came to the fore. And reader response is something that teachers will recognise because it's something that they ask students to do. They ask students to participate emotionally in the text. They ask students to draw on their repertoire of background knowledge when they're reading the texts. And by texts, I'm talking about children's literature uh, and various ways of thinking about the text and the children's literature experiences, the characters' experiences, relate back to their own lives. So there's that notion of analogy. So all of this in terms of encouraging emotions, making analogies, is all part of privileging the reader. And that was very much part of what the New English favoured. It came up uh, through that way that the classrooms were organised, where groups were an organic part of classroom arrangements. And that allowed an, an interpretive community of readers to develop, which then led into the formation of many literature-based programs. And Peter was part of the publications of those and encouraged that notion of literature-based programs through in various ways. Mm -hmm.